the current sermon series that we're talking about is the, the this is the Christian secret to a happy life. And so we've been looking at different ways in which God has intended our happiness, different ways in which God has provided for our happiness. And um, man, I love this part here in 1 John chapter 2, the first couple of verses. He says, my dear children, and this is the Holy Spirit inspiring John, who's the oldest apostle, at, living apostle at this time. And he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, period. <laughs> um, this is, by the way, the book, the Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses. So this is actually just one long letter. So this is technically, John didn't intend this to be a new chapter. The, he's, he's writing this at the end of a number of things that he's been sharing in what we call 1 John chapter 1. And at the end of 1 John chapter 1, at the beginning of chapter 2, John gives us a description as to why he's writing these things. He says, Dear children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin, period. There's no asterisks there. <laughs> like, I know you're going to. Like, is, is none of that. You know, oh, Pastor Harry, do you believe people could not sin? I, no, I don't. I, I don't. I'm just reading. <laughs> I, I'm just reading. Like, I'm just reading the Bible. And apparently, the Holy Spirit believes that the stuff that was written in 1 John chapter 1 was enough for the early church to be able, when they got that truth, when they received that truth, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, that when they were set free, to the truth of what it means to walk in the light and some of the things we've been talking about, that the result of that would be a church that does not sin. Now, that's kind of radical, right? And, and of course, you can get weird and you can get into perfectionism and into strange things. But it's just, just what, if, what, if, what if in 2021, what if we just read the Bible and just believed it? A, here's, here's, here's a great strategy. We're, we're not going to water down Scripture to the level of our experience Rather, maybe Scripture was supposed to help our experience rise to the level of our faith. That just because you have an experience, it doesn't mean that's not possible. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have it for you. So I would, I would just challenge you if, you, if you, if you get uncomfortable whenever you read passages like that. This is not a slap in the face. God's not uh, ready to judge you and strike you with lightning. This is a hopeful message that, that there is power to walk above sin in this life, that God has it available to you. And so this is what he says. I write this so that you will not sin, period. But he says, if not when, but if anybody does sin. So I love that the Holy Spirit is also a realist, and he also knows our frame. He knows that we're dust. He knows that we'll struggle with some things. And he says, look, if anyone does sin, let's, let's, let's just cover that. If anybody does sin, he is immediately excommunicated from the church, right? That's what it said. Oh, no, that's not what it says. Oh, um, he's cast out into utter darkness. He is disowned. No, no. Okay. If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ, and he is righteous. So last week, well, not actually last week, but last time I preached, I preached a, a message entitled, You Have an Advocate. It was all about the advocacy that Jesus represents for us. He is, the, we, we talked about the prodigal son. And how uh, in the prodigal son story, you have really it's a prodigal brother because you have two brothers. One brother leaves the father's house and he goes away. The other brother stays and does everything right. And Jesus was basically saying, look, I am the brother who has stayed and done everything right. But instead of staying in the father's house, I have left the father's house, father's house to seek and to save the lost. So this is his advocacy. He chases us down. If anyone sins, you better believe that Jesus is coming for you. He is going to pursue you. He is going to reach out to you. He's going to convict you. He's going to draw you because he is our advocate. Actually, we have two advocates, we found out. We have the Holy Spirit and Jesus both working together for our salvation. So you have a Holy Spirit who is, who is convicting and convincing. You have Jesus who is chasing, and you have God the Father who is longing and loving. So anyway, the, the assurance that's in this passage is, is, is wonderful. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Not, not a license, but an advocate. <laughs> an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. Verse 2 is what I want to focus on today. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the atoning 
sacrifice. Actually, um, the word sacrifice is not in the original language here. Um, it's just one word, and that is atonement. If you're reading King James or New King James, it probably says propitiation. Um, that's kind of a funky word. Uh, but actually, in the original Greek, the word is just atonement. He is the atonement uh, for our sins. So today I want to talk to you. Uh, last week we talked about that we have an advocate. Today I want to talk about the fact that we have an atonement and we have an atoner. And, uh, and so we, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a bunch of adjectives and adverbs and stuff around the word atonement. But um, uh, just to start off the message, I, I thought I'd share a little story from this past week. Uh, we were doing some Christmas shopping with Micah and Madden. I took Micah and Madden to do some Christmas shopping for my dad to buy him some shoes. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, in the Fleming family, I've taken on the role of the style, um, the style contributor to my family. Um, <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I'm going to choke on that one. I say that lightly because uh, technically I took on the role when I was 12, and people wouldn't wear the stuff I bought them. And so it was no good. Um, it, it doesn't work if you do a makeover for people, and then they don't, they don't make over themselves. It just hangs in the in the in the, in, in the closet. And so anyway, I, at forty now, I've learned a couple things. And so I was taking my kids to to go pick out some shoes for dad. We're going to buy him some shoes, and they they found some shoes which indeed I think my dad would probably wear, but they were kind of on the ugly side. And so I said, look, we're not going to. I don't. I don't. I don't want to contribute. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I don't want, I don't want to have that on my conscience, you know. Um, Dad can go to the store and buy whatever he wants to buy, but when I'm buying stuff, it's going to be something kind of cool, kind of, kind of, you know. And um, so anyway, um, so I was striking down a bunch of options. We finally uh, uh, found found a pair of shoes that were kind of cool, but also comfortable, so Dad would wear that, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And and Micah, Micah, he's my nine-year-old son. He said to me, he said, "Well, Dad, Gramps is already married." I said, "Well." What is this? What is that? What is like? What is this? yes? Yes, he is. That's how I got here. Like, what does that have to do with anything? And he's like, well, you know, he's already married. I said, look, you're gonna have to spell this out for me, son. He's like, well, he doesn't really have to try, cause he's already married. I said, oh man. I said, what? I don't know what your mom has been teaching you at homeschooling, but we need to have a talk. I said, what? I said, look, I'm already married. Does this look like somebody who's not trying? Don't answer that. You know, be careful how you answer that. And uh, I, said, I said, no, 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 no. Look, look, Gra like, Gra Graham is going to wake up every morning. She's going to roll, roll over, and she's going she's gonna to think one of two things. Either, man, I'm glad I married that man, or, oh, I'm stuck with him. I would prefer the first. And I'm not saying the shoes necessarily affect that, but I'm saying it's all part of it. It's part of the whole thing. And uh, anyway, man, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, I'm going to have to have a sit down with Micah's fiance if he ever chooses <laughs> to get married. I'm just going to have to say, look, we did what we could. <laughs> He's yours now. <laughs> so, Lord, just help. <laughs> just we'll, we'll pray from a distance. But... Um, but no, it was, it was just, just, just kind of a funny story. Kids say the darndest things. And uh, man, I don't know where in the world he, he got that or got that thinking. But it's interesting, though, that thinking it does come from, I think it comes from a very humanistic sort of mindset that we tend to uh, value others based on what they can give us or get us. And we also, the downside, of, well, I say the downside, that's not very good. But the real zinger is that because we value others based on what they give us, we then value ourselves based on what we feel like we're able to offer others. So it's very contractual. And so even at nine years old, Micah doesn't know much about dating, but apparently he's already kind of got it figured out, <laughs> something, of this contractual nature. And, 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 and what I love about God is that God tends to flip humanism on its head. Uh, God tends to flip this idea that my value is based on what I can give somebody or that their value is based on what they can give me. God tends to flip that on his head. And I think this passage is a perfect example of that, that here in 1 John, if you're reading through chapter 1, you might mistakenly get the idea that God saved you so that you could be a good Christian and bring him glory. 
you might mistakenly get the idea that God, that God went through all of the, the act of salvation for you so that you won't mess up and won't make him look bad. Right? And so then you get to chapter 2, and, 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 and John does say, look, the point of all of this is absolutely that you would lay down sin and not pick it back up again. But if anyone does sin, let's get this transaction mentality out of your mind. We have an advocate and we have an atonement. And so the, 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 the beauty of Scripture is that God is not transactional like that. Because you can, you, uh, that's a part of our human nature to believe that everything's transactional. And then we come into the church and we come into a relationship with God and we begin to believe that it works the same way, but it doesn't. This, this idea of atonement is not you give some, God something and then God gives you something. Atonement is a work that is done by Jesus on our behalf for us. And so, really, I, I just want to share some good news with you today. Whether you are a believer or whether you're thinking about becoming a believer or whether you're skeptical of believers, the truth, one of the reasons why we're so crazy is because we believe in something called the atonement. And uh, we don't talk about that very often. You probably haven't heard a lot of sermons like, all right, today we're going to talk about the atonement. Um, uh, it's not a general, you know, get up and shout and jump. And, but it's really, really powerful. And so just to give you a little picture, I, I want to go to Leviticus chapter 16 and probably do a little more teaching um, today because I, I think this is going to help you have a more biblical understanding of what is going on on the cross, what is going on in the empty tomb, and what is going on in heaven right now for you and for me if we sin. So Leviticus 16, um, start at verse 3, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read quite a bit, and then I'll explain it. So this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. Aaron was the high priest at that time. Um, this is how Aaron is entering the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He's to tie the linen sash around him and put on linen turban. Um, these are sacred garments, so he must <clears throat> bathe himself with water before he puts them on. Now, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is not the usual uh, attire. For, for a priest, for a high priest. The usual attire would be you know, <coughs> very regal. Um, he would have a massive turban with gold on it. He would have a big golden chest plate uh, with uh, gems uh, representing each one of the tribes of Israel. I'm going to need a cough drop, these allergies, man. Has anybody else got some cedar? Anybody else experiencing a little bit of cedar around here? Man, but luckily, I have my cough drops. But they would, they, they, they would look almost kingly, and that was intentional. God wanted the kingship and the priesthood to be together. And so it was very intentional. But now for this particular day, and um, <clears throat> as, as we get reading, <coughs> you're going to see that, that this is the Day of Atonement, seventh month and the tenth day um, of, of, <clears throat> of the Jewish calendar. And so now he says, I want you to instead put on linen. <coughs> and there we go. So someone else will have to preach the rest of the message. Um, I have the passages if you'd like to read them. Um, and so he's put on linen. Now, in those days, linen would have been kind of like underwear. Actually, I think this is similar to what David wore um, when his wife became mad at him because he was dancing in public like this. Um, <laughs> uh, it's so interesting. This is the most important day of the high priest's life. Uh, once a year, he would have a day of atonement where he would atone for the sins of the entire um, Israelite community. And on this day, he wasn't allowed to wear his suit and tie. He had to <laughs> wear his pajamas into uh, the most holy place and to do the most powerful work because, well, humility is a big part of atonement the humility of the high priest, because this is a type and a shadow. This is a picture of what is coming, that the ultimate high priest, who is Jesus, would come clothed in humility, and that he would make atonement for our sins, not as a king and not with a crown, but rather with, a, with thorns pressed on his head and a fake robe put around his, his shoulders. 
that in humility he would atone for our sins. And God's already setting up the type in the shadow here. So he says, look, you have to wear just, just linen, and, <clears throat> and then you have to take two male goats for a sin offering. Notice that, two goats for one offering. <clears throat> a sin, singular offering, singular. A ram for a burnt offering. And then in verse 7, he's to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. In other words, uh, lots were basically like dice, and you would roll dice to, dis to determine what God's will was. That's how they did it um, three, 4,000 years ago. Because the Holy Spirit hadn't been sent into the earth, and because each believer didn't have a, re a record of Scripture, they had to roll dice to figure out what God's will was. Uh, it's amazing. Some people still do that. <laughs> As a pastor, it's amazing the amount of people that are like, I don't know, I'm just going to go try to figure out what God's will is. Um, but now we have the Holy Spirit, and we don't have to roll dice. We don't have to take shots in the dark. We don't have to throw a dart at a map and figure out where God wants us to live. Um, you know, uh, God is speaking to us now through his Holy Spirit and through the word. And so, but in those days, God said, I want you to cast lots. The, the key is that he is going to be the one to choose. There's these two rams or, or two goats, and he will choose which one will die and which one will live. And one dies and one is the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat will be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. <clears throat> now, I'll cover that here in a minute. He shall then, verse 15, he shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover, uh, which is the top of the Ark of the Covenant, um, and in front of it. In other words, dripping the blood, sprinkling it all, all over the place. He actually would sprinkle it throughout the holy place in several of the, art the, the articles. In this way, he shall make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. Now, what's God saying there? God's, God's noticing, and, and you may have noticed this, that humans have a couple of problems. One is that we have sin, and this is evil, and this is a, this is a problem. So if somebody um, steals from their neighbor, right, that's sin. So this is a problem within that, that person who steals, but it also becomes a problem for the neighbor who loses some of the things that he stole. Uh, it also becomes a problem for the neighbor who can become bitter um, because of what was stolen. It also becomes a problem for the other neighbors around him who can become guarded and less likely to share and selfish because you have to look out for yourself. What happens is there is an act of sin, but then there is a condition of sinfulness that begins to spread through a community. And this is what God is saying. God is saying, look, the problem isn't just what you did. The problem is what you did to your community. That you didn't, it's not just that, it wasn't this isolated incident. And we've seen this in America as well. It's not just isolated incidents. It's, it's, what, it's what spills out after these isolated inc incidents. And so God says we need to make atonement. In other words, we need to make cleansing. The word atonement, a good way to remember that is um, at one mint. If you split up the word at one mint that God, uh, that Jesus Christ creates an at one with God. It is bringing together two opposing parties and bringing them to peace, bringing them to a place of peace. And so God says, look, there's, there's a problem in, in the world, and the problem is sin, but it's not just removing personal sin. It's also cleansing the atmosphere of a community. And so there's multiple levels of atonement that go on here. Uh, first, you know, he says, he says, look, he'll have to slaughter the goat. Um, this, by the way, um, had to be done by the high priest in his pajamas. <laughs> uh, the sin offering for the people, take its blood behind the curtain. That's important. That's the curtain. That's the, the veil that separated. <clears throat> and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover. In other words, you need to sprinkle it. Why, why are you sprinkling it, sprinkling it on the atonement cover? Because the atonement cover is part of the tabernacle. And so God wanted 
the blood to be poured on every little part of the tabernacle to clean the atmosphere of sin. So God's dealing with the atonement of the sin of the individual, but also all around. He says, you need to put it on this article, on that article, sprinkle it around seven times, I think, <clears throat> at one stage, he says. So there has to be a lot of sprinkling. Um, and so he says, uh, the most holy place, because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting. So there, there again, you need to go into the tent of meeting, sprinkle blood there, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out. Having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. In other words, Aaron um, <clears throat> had to do this by himself. This was, this was very uncommon. This wasn't the way that things normally worked. Uh, in those days, the Levites, there were several of them, several priests that would participate in slaughtering animals and helping with families with sacrifices. But on this day, there, nobody else was allowed to do anything except the high priest, because the high priest was a type and a shadow of Jesus. Because when it comes to atonement, Jesus reserves that strictly for himself. He doesn't allow your, 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 your good works to come, in, to come into the, to the room. He doesn't allow your, your religion to come into your room or your church attendance or your tithing. Nothing else can come into, because nobody else can do for you what Jesus can do for you. Only, G, Jesus isn't selfish. He's not like, well, I want to be the one to atone for their sin. No, he, he's the only one who's able to make atonement for our sins. He's the only one who has the, the capabilities to do that. And so God said, on this day, only Aaron is allowed to go into the tent of meeting. Only Aaron, and I, th I think one commentator said that Aaron would have killed like 15 different animals that day. Um, and uh, this is no small task, by the way. This is a lot. Uh, uh, one of them was a, was a ram. One of them was a, a bull. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever um, butchered a bull with a, like, with an ancient knife. I don't know if you've ever dressed it, because he, he doesn't just have to, you know, kill it. He has to kill it himself. So here's a priest in his pajamas tackling this bull, having to kill it ceremonially, and then having to cut different parts of its, of its legs and its thighs, and yada, 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 this goes here and that goes there. He's basically dressing it. 15 different animals that day. It's a lot of work. So my point is that we, like, a lot of this is lost on us because we, we don't, we're not used to seeing that. We're not used to being a part of that system. But it, to the ancient Hebrew, they would understand the high priest on the day of atonement is working from sunup to sundown. He's sweating. He is laboring. He is working his tail off. He has got blood all over his pajamas. It's a messy situation. And yet this picture of a messy sweaty, bloody high priest is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do in our behalf. Uh, from carrying the heavy cross up the hill of Golgotha to work, I mean, he was working in the garden. He's, he's crying out to his father and his, his sweat becomes drops of blood. He's working, uh, he's laboring so hard for you and for me. And he is the picture of the high priest who is working for atonement. And this is, it's, it's amazing because God doesn't usually work. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but God doesn't like lift a finger. Like when he created the world, he never got off of the couch. Quite literally. He, the Bible doesn't say he even stood up. He just said, let there be. And then he filled in the blank a few times and everything was. All things were, were put together by the word of his power. He never exerted any energy to hurl galaxies into existence. To, to, when he made man, that's when he stooped down, Scripture says, stooped down into the dirt and, 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 and shaped us. And then he blew into the face of the dirt thing that he had made, and it became a living human. The most work he did was playing in the mud. And now God... On the Day of Atonement, when he atoned for our sins, is sweating drops of blood. He is carrying a cross that he cannot bear. It's too much for him. Nothing's ever been too much for him. 
He holds the world together by the word of his power. Nothing's ever been too much, and yet this cross was too much for him, and he stumbles and he falls and he can't carry it. They had to get some other guy to, to carry it. The Roman guard said, all right, this, we, we, we need to get the show on the road. So they, somebody else had to carry his cross for him. Why? Because he's laboring for our atonement, for our at one that we would be at one with God, that we would, even though, even though there is sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our atonement. He is the one that brings us back together into fellowship with God. And we see this on the day of, of atonement uh, here in the Old Testament. We also see it on the day when Christ was crucified. He was laboring as a high priest before God in order to make atonement for us. Uh, verse 20 says, When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. And he is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and all of their sins. In other words, ceremoniously transfer all the sin onto the goat. And then he is to send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. A remote place, I think King James says, an uninhabited place. Verse 28 says, this is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you must deny yourself, that means fasting, and not do any work, whether native born or foreigner residing among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all of your sins. And that was a type and a shadow of what Jesus would do. So Jesus worked for our atonement, for our at one But then Jesus was also, so Jesus was the priest, and especially if you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see the, the fulfillment of that. Jesus was the priest, but he was also the sacrifice. And this is where, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of theology with you. Um, there's, I was talking to Roe about this the other day, and, and, and one of the things that, that um, I think is wrong that we tend to say, and you probably heard a lot of people say, is that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. You probably heard that quite a bit. Um, that's that's close to right, but it's it's just off enough to maybe give you the wrong idea. And so let me explain. Um, to say that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin is well, that's not atonement. Paying a penalty is not atonement. Atonement is bringing oneness or bringing connectedness at one meant it's bridging the gap between god and man and and to say that jesus paid the penalty for our sin one of the problems with that is the focus is on penalty and the the concept i guess is that god is a wrathful god and god is an angry god and god just has to punish somebody and so this whole thing is all about punishment but <laughs> when jesus was hanging on the cross this was not a sign of god's wrath this was a sign of god's love so it's not really, so the focus should never be on punishment. It's just, it's just, that's not the point. You don't see that in Leviticus with the high priest. You don't see God saying, now, now the priest will ceremoniously take the punishment for somebody else. You don't see that substitutionary concept in the priestly Levitical system. Because, because, because well, one, it, does, it would be double jeopardy, actually. Like, if Jesus took the punishment for everyone's sin, which it says in 1 John, that Jesus atones for everyone's sin, so if atonement means to take the punishment for, then that means God can't really hold anybody accountable for their sin, or it's double jeopardy. Like, if God judges you for sin that Jesus already paid for, then that's double jeopardy, and, and that's, not, that's not a good judge. I mean, if, 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 you, if, if you were cruising down the road in a, in a V10 8-liter car and maybe i don't know 150 miles an hour through a school zone right and a police officer sees you uh he flips on his his flashers he pulls out to go get you and then um i don't know somebody uh, in an old rugged cross vehicle named jesus pulls up to the police and says look I, harry's harry's a pretty good guy he just he has a problem with the with the, the gas pedal but i want to pay his penalty all right what's the penalty well it's like 10 points on your license and it's like i don't know ten thousand dollar fine okay fine and so jesus or jesus goes and pays my ten thousand dollar fine now the judge can't go find me later on and say hey 
uh, uh, you owe me $10,000 because it's already been paid. So if it's merely about punishment, if atonement is merely about punishment, then truly God has no way of ever punishing anybody because Jesus apparently has taken everybody's punishment. Now, I was talking to Ro about this. She's like, well, when I was brought up, I always heard that you have to accept it. Jesus paid for it, but you have to accept it, kind of like a gift. And I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense in terms of birthday parties. Right? I mean, I, I bought you a gift. I have it for you. Will you accept it? No, I don't want your stinking gift. It's probably ugly shoes. Okay, fine. You don't accept my stinking gift. Fine. But, but we're not talking about birthday parties here. We're talking about an eternity in heaven or hell. We're talking about punishment, like eternal punishment. And if Jesus already paid my punishment, then why do I have to go accept it? Do, 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 I, do I have to go to the police station and accept that somebody paid my speeding ticket? No, it was paid. It was done. And so that's why atonement is not about, that's one of the reasons, and that is probably not a very theologically deep reason. You can go on YouTube and listen to the much smarter people talk about this. But the way that I understand it is that, is that the atonement is not primarily about punishment. Rather, it is about at one minute, or it's about bringing together man with God. So Jesus was not taking the punishment for our sin. Rather, he was taking our sins. And when you take the sins, you also take the punishment. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like, like praying over your Twinkies, asking God to subtract the calories out of them. It doesn't work that way. What you need to do if you want to lose weight is, is get rid of your Twinkies altogether. Then you get rid of the Twinkies and the calories pro-fasting illustration right there. But the, the atonement message, the good news of the gospel, is not that God took away the punishment of sin. It's that God took away sin. And when he took away sin, then he also took away the punishment, because without sin, there's no punishment. And so the good news here is seen within these two rams. And the reason why I'm explaining that is because if you have the concept that atonement is merely about punishment, you're going to miss the beauty of the richness of the illustration of the two goats, I guess. I keep saying rams. I don't know. They're, the, the two different goats that were, that, that were selected. So both goats represent things which Jesus has done for us and is offering us in the atonement. The first is the first one that, which was chosen by God um, to be killed. Um, his blood was put on the altar. His blood was shed for the atonement uh, of the people of Israel as well as for the building uh, and for the uncleanness, which God would call uncleanness of the, of the place. Uh, and this is such a beautiful type and shadow because when Jesus was crucified, remember, there was two, one on Pilate's right and one on Pilate's left. And Pilate said, uh, which would you have me release to you? And they released to him. They, 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 they called for him to release the dirty one. They called for him to release the sinful one, which is exactly what happens here in the two goats. You have one goat, which is pure. He is slaughtered. Another goat, which all the sins of the world is transferred onto him. He's no longer pure when the sins of the people are transferred onto him, and he is released. So the type and the shadow of when Jesus was crucified and what's going on here in the Old Testament is pretty profound. But this, this first ram or his first goat would have been slaughtered his neck would have been throat would have been slit his blood would have been drained out and his blood would have been taken into the holy place because that's that's the first thing that the blood of jesus does for us is it provides access into the presence of god it is with access that you can go beyond the veil with with this bowl of blood and that's what the priest would do so the blood of jesus provides access into the presence of god and it opens up the veil for us. It tears the veil which separated us from God. It removes that thing which separated us, and it welcomes us into the Father's house. And that's what the first goat did. His blood paved the way for, for the priest to step into the presence of God. And without that blood, he better not go in there because he needed and see that's that, that that's the thing when we think of blood we think of death for us blood is like halloween it's it's it symbolizes death if you walk into a room with a bunch of blood on the walls you're like who died here right but in these days god is not saying that it symbolizes death the blood actually symbolizes the life of the animal that gave it it was a sacred thing back uh, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And so you almost miss the connotation that God wasn't saying, I want, I want death to be everywhere. No, he said, I want life to be sprinkled everywhere. 
I want the life of this animal to be remembered in every corner of my holy place. It was an honor kind of thing. God was saying, look, that animal was precious to me. The animal was important to me. The animal was created by me. The animal was innocent. And that animal gave its life so that you could have access into my presence. And so you need to be sure to sprinkle that blood on the, on the, on the box, on the, on the laver over here, on the menorah over there. You need to be sure to get the blood everywhere so that that life will be spread everywhere. And this is what God wants from us, even as during our 21 days of prayer and fasting. God doesn't want, like, death everywhere. He doesn't want people feeling mournful and horrible everywhere. He wants life sprinkled everywhere. He wants joy sprinkled everywhere. He wants peace sprinkled everywhere. So this is what the blood of Jesus does for us. It doesn't bring death to us. It brings life to us. And it brings his life and his quality of life his level of life provides access and it provides life to us but then the next goat was called the scapegoat because it would be the goat that escapes <laughs> um and 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 and, f and for so often um Ro was telling me about a francine rivers book which she was reading called the sin eater i don't know if you've read that but i think it's based on a true story from um some place where they they had this this community in Scotland, yeah, the crazy people up there. They had a, they had a, you can't understand a word they say, it's for real. Their language, it's, it's English, but it's not. Um, so uh, in Scotland, I, I guess years ago, they had a, a sin eater in these different villages where they had an individual who assumedly would receive, I guess, all the sins of everybody in the community. And then they would take communion, the special communion, and they would basically sort of as long as they were still living, everybody felt like their sins were being transferred to that individual. They felt like as long as that individual is still living, I'm okay. I'm good. My sins are being transferred. I don't have to pay the penalty for my sin because so-and-so is, 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 is partaking of communion on my behalf. And um, that's a very substitutionary way of looking at atonement. And that's not what Jesus did here. That's not what this goat did. This goat, by the way, uh, symbolically, not, not literally, but symbolically took on the sins of, of all of the people. And then he said, you need to hand the goat off to a, a, a man appointed to the task. Is that it? Give it to a man appointed to the task. And that man will carry, will, will lead the goat out of the city. One commentator said that they had to move it at least 10 miles outside of the city. I don't know if you've gone on a 10-mile hike before, but it, that's, that's a ways. The idea was that the goat would never be able to make it back, would never find its way back. And which is why this, this, this goat doesn't symbolize Jesus in his death because he came back like in three days. So, so clearly he's not the goat that just wanders off and got, got lost. But rather, this is the living goat. So they both symbolize what Jesus did though. In his death, in Jesus' death, he paved the way for us to have access to God. But in his resurrection, in his life, he carries away the sins of the world. He ever lives to make intercession for us, to literally walk our sins out of our life and out of the camp and away from us. And man, and some of us, I think we literally, we have about a 50% version of the atonement. We have the Jesus who shed his blood for us, but we don't have the Jesus who carries anything away. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see the open door, we'll see the open Access and we'll say, oh, isn't that great? And it's wonderful to think about and to pray about. But we dare not go in because we know we still got our pet goat with us. We still have our past, all of our shame, all of our guilt still walking around. We've never, we've never given it, I think the King James says, a capable man. Put it in the hands of a capable man and let him take it out. So my challenge is to you that maybe 2021 is the year when you finally take your past shame and your past guilt and all, all like everything that has been pronounced on that because here's the deal like we tend to make pet goats <laughs> out of the scapegoat because it's comforting to us because in times of difficulty in times of transition in times of craziness we can go back to that to that old goat we can go back to those old memories and the old labels that we've put placed on ourselves and the old st stuff that we've blamed the old self-pity that we've sat in for so long and we can sit with that goat and it can be comforting to us but but god told aaron no no you have to kill one 
because that's symbolic of when Jesus went to the cross. But then there must be one that's living, and he will carry the sins away from the camp, because that's symbolic of Jesus when he is risen from the dead. The living Savior will take our sins away. And so at, at the same time, but we have to release the goat. We have to put the goat in the hands of a, a capable man. And this is, this is the atonement that, that Jesus does for us. Uh, in, in his death, he, he opens up heaven for us. He opens up access to us. But in his life, he removes the sin from us, and he carries it outside of the camp and far away. And, 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 and literally, he said, put the, put, the, put the goat in a place that's uninhabited, which means he's, no one's going to take care of it. He stop feeding you need to stop feeding your shame. Stop feeding your self-pity. Quit giving it treats, all right? Quit, 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 quit throwing some hay to it every now and then. Like, like, he needs to be in a place where nobody will take care of him, and nobody will tend to him, and nobody will make sure that he keeps on going. So the, the guilt and the shame and the sins of the past have to be exited from your life and passed out out 10 miles or more beyond and left in a place where, where you can't get to it. And this is how God brings about our atonement. And so in 1 John chapter 2, he says, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the entire world. So the atonement is an at-one-ment that Jesus creates for us on our behalf, by himself, by the way, without your religious works, without, without your, on, even on your best day or on your worst day, the atonement is still applicable to you and to me. But, but it, is, it, is, it is twofold. On the one hand, there's forgiveness and cleansing by the blood, but on the other hand, there is removal and separation of our sin from us so that we don't keep living in it, so that we don't keep repeating it, so that he can truly take judgment away because he takes the sin away. and There's no need for judgment anymore. And so in these next 21 days, we're going to be spending a lot of time praying. Uh, I mentioned 6 a.m. prayer. Uh, you can join us. Um, this week, this Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about repentance. So we're going to get more into atonement and more into uh, confession. What does it mean? What does First John 1 9 mean if we confess our sins? Um, we're going to be talking about that. Uh, it, it, by the way, it doesn't mean listing out all of the things you've done wrong. That's not what it means. It means coming to agreement with what God says about your sins, um, which you might be surprised is a lot more hopeful than anything you've ever said about your sins. <laughs> It's a lot more hope-filled and life-giving than anything you've thought about your sins. Um, so, so we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to target in our prayers, focus in our prayer. And then throughout the week, we're going to have, um, uh, for those of you, I, I know some of you are fasting our Facebook, uh, fasting Facebook in general, social media. But for those of you that are not fasting Facebook, we are going to be on Facebook every day at noon, uh, Monday through Saturday. Different teachers are, are um, going live on Facebook. They're going to share some thoughts um, on a different prayer focus each day, and then we're going to pray together. So I would encourage you, if you, if you don't want to get up or if you can't get up at 6 a.m., um, the Lord is still awake at noon. Um, you can join with us on your lunch hour, all right? You can step away for a minute. And even if you are fasting Facebook, you can stop fasting for a minute to join in prayer with people. Just don't check all of the nonsense and uh, all that, but uh, just jump in there with prayer, um, because what what happens is what happens is there's this great reality of atonement, but it's not remembered by us very often, and it's not applied to our lives very often. We forget that we have an atonement. We we don't we don't worship him for his atonement. We don't think about. It. So what I want to do over these next twenty one days is I want to focus. I want to have blood over everything, and and not 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 in a gory way, but I want to have the blood of Jesus on every song on every message, on every prayer time, because it's only by the blood. You, you, can, you can take authority of all kinds of things that you want, but only because of the blood of Jesus. We are sons and daughters of God because of the blood, not because we're worthy, not because we're good people, not because, you know, we, uh, we have some Oprah intrinsic value inside of us, that this is gooey goodness in the deep center of our soul. No, like we deserve hell. We were lost. We were blind, but now we see because of the gift that God has given us, this at one minute that he has 
granted to us to connect with the Father. So throughout these 21 days, I, I, I'm starting with some teaching today, and I want you to let it sink in. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to worship him for, for the atoning work that he has done on your behalf. He has already shed his blood, and he has already opened up heaven for us, and he has already sent away our sins. And, um, and in, in that sense, truly, that is where we receive the gift, because it's not about punishment. It is about something that the love of God displayed for us on the cross. And so, Father, we come to you right now. We just thank you for your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and for what he has done on our behalf, that while we were sinners, before, before there was even a sinner on planet Earth, there was a Savior in heaven. He was slain from the foundations of the world. Before, before there was a problem, you already had the solution. You already planned our redemption and our salvation and our life. You, you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so, Lord, uh, may, may we lean into that life. May we receive that life today. May we put our faith in you and receive you. And, and that's, that's, that's really, it's really as simple as it is. I mean, literally, Jesus was the only, uh, Jesus is the high priest, so he's the only one working the work of atonement. So when you call on Jesus, you have called on everyone necessary to bring salvation to your life, to bring life change to your life, no matter how strong the addictions are or how long they've lasted, no matter how difficult the circumstance or how deep the pain or the hurt or the offense or whatever. When you call on Jesus, you have called on everyone that is necessary to bring total salvation to you. And so we do. We call. Let's, let's just do that right now, just, just as, a, as a church. Let's call on the name of Jesus. Jesus, we call on you right now. We need you. We need your blood applied to our life. We need your sacrifice applied to our life. We need at one with God. We need, some of us have, have, have had at one minute, and then, and then we, we chose to walk away. So, so, so 1 John applies to you, if anyone sins, we still have an at one minute with the Father. We can still turn to him. We can still call on his name. And when we've called on his name, we've called on everyone necessary. There's no other helper needed. There's no other benefit. It's not after we figure things out or after we learn how to change this or fix that. No, we call on Jesus and we say, I make you the Lord of my life. I choose to follow you. We call on you for, for grace. We call on you for power. We call on you for mercy. And then we receive it by faith. And so Jesus, we do. We, we, we call on that name. I think it was Acts chapter 3 where uh, uh, people are, uh, Peter is preaching to the crowd, and they say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, it's simple, repent, repent, and be baptized, each and every one of you, for the remission of your sins, so that times of refreshing may come <laughs> from the presence of the Lord. Man, 2021, Lord, may it be a year of refreshing <laughs> from the presence of the Lord. Not from an IRS check, but from the presence of the Lord. This is, our, our, our souls are tired. It's not just our bank account. Our spirits are tired. Our emotions are sagging. Our minds are tired. We must have times of refreshing, which is like a fresh breath of fresh air. It's like, it's like breathing in and breathing out. It's just relaxing. It's resting. It's not being tense anymore. It's not your shoulders not being tight anymore and your back being all out of alignment. No, it's, 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 it's rest. It's relaxation. And this is what God has for each and every one of us. He has times of refreshing. He has times of relaxing. He has times of, no, no, no. You don't, you don't have to get up and do anything. Just receive. Just sit back. You're in the Father's house now. Just sit back and just receive. We already, got, we already have all the provisions set up for you. He's already done all of the work on Calvary. He's already sweat, and he's already pr provided everything that you need. So just sit back and receive from him. And so there we do. We receive from you the, the at one with our Father, the fellowship that we so desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I love you all. Thanks for bearing with me. Hopefully next week my voice will be better. But 
Um, we'll see you this week. Uh, I'm actually doing the first uh, devotional tomorrow at noon. So if you tune in Facebook, we'll have somebody every single day at noon uh, in the mornings. Um, if you're interested in tuning in in the morning, um, you can text the word prayer to 512-960-1617, uh, and we will get that 